Just wanted to welcome everybody to NABT's Community Conversations webinar series. This series is hosted by the two-year section of NABT. And our goal has been to bring timely topics and very interesting speakers to our members and the larger biology community. And my name is Sheila Vimu, and I'm an associate professor of biology at Wabanzi Community College, Sugar Grove. Our campus actually sits on the lands, traditional lands of the people of Potawatomi tribe. And I will be serving as your moderator. And it has been my honor to serve as the chair of the two-year section at NABT with Carla Smith Fuller, who is the vice chair from Stella Charles Gutman Community College and secretary Cleo Roll from Capital Community College. And just a few notes for our audience as they are strolling into the webinar. Um, there'll be closed captioning available. The session is actually being recorded it will be uploaded on the NABT webpage under events and webinars, so you can actually share this with others who cannot be here today. We are actually going to keep the chat feature on and promote conversations because we are a community that likes to talk and share. So please use it and ask some questions or comments. I will field some of the questions from the chat to the speaker once the presentation is actually over. So you'll be hearing this presentation from Gabe Guzman on this very timely subject of ungrading. And I'll take a minute to introduce our speaker, Dr. Gabe Guzman. So Gabe's education journey started in Guatemala City, his country of origin at the Center for Health Sciences. From there, he was invited to Sweden to complete his master's and doctoral degrees in immunology and later his postdoctoral work in molecular endocrinology at Duke University. His teaching career began as an adjunct instructor at a community college in Peoria, Illinois. And later he was hired as a full-time faculty at Triton College, River Grove, Illinois to teach microbiology. And that's where I first met him many, many years ago when I was adjuncting there. He built the cell and tissue culture program at Triton he also designed a beautiful microbiology lab into a collaborative active learning space. And this lab has actually served as the basis for remodeling for many of Triton's amazing lab spaces. A few years ago, he was awarded the Faculty of the Year Award. He served as the chair of the science department for many years, and he currently serves as the coordinator for the biotech lab technician program at Triton. And they have a steady stream of students who are employed in various local industries. And with no further ado, let's begin the show and take it away, Gabe. Thank you, Sheila. Um, those are very kind words uh, from you, and thank you for the invitation. Sometimes it's hard to think um, what exactly am I going to present. Uh, on grading, it's, it's still a little bit of a controversial um, uh, topic, um, and it's not the only thing that I will talk to you about. It's so I, I thought that it would be perhaps just um, good to share a little bit of my uh, education journey. So as a student, um, we all go into college thinking that everything is, is going to be a straight line, right? a straight line of success. So we have a perception that everything is going to be just fine. We know we're going to finish in, in this number of years and we're going to graduate when I get a job or something like that. And uh, for me, as I'm sure um, happens to a lot of students, even now, when I went to college just more than 30 years ago, but even now we know that the um, the road is not so straight. There are a lot of uh, ups and downs, and eventually we make it. Now there are more things that uh, I, as a student, would want to have um, available to me in terms of you know counseling or uh, resources with information, tutors, things like that. Um, I was born in a very small country, Guatemala, in Central America. And we don't have such a thing as community colleges. There is you no know, this time where students can spend some time, first of all, deciding if they want to go to college uh, or if college is for them to begin with. For us, after high school is the university and it's sing or swim. 
Uh, but eventually I did, I did uh, make it uh, in Guatemala. The type of education, as I've been told, is a little similar to the French system. And I, I'm not familiar with the French system, by the way. But in essence, what we do is five years of course core. And then we have a year of uh, research that in, in which we have to write a thesis as well that we have to defend before a tribunal. Um, and if we pass, we don't get grades. We don't get uh, a, a number. We actually get a pass or fail. We get grades in all the classes. But at the very end, if we don't pass that, that uh, tribunal examination, we don't graduate. And we graduate with a, a degree that is called a licentiate, right? Uh, in some countries, it transfers directly as a master's. Uh, in the US, it doesn't transfer only as a, as a BS. Um, Part of my research life it started in college and that opened, opened a lot of doors for me, including the door that took me to Sweden to um, complete my master's in medical microbiology studying tropical diseases, which when you think of Sweden and tropical, it doesn't really go in the same sentence, right? But like many used to say in the past, we had the bugs, but they had the money to study them. So I ended up there. Um, and this has been one of the, the most enriching um, opportunities in my life. I also got my PhD from the same place uh, in infectious disease control. It was mostly focused still on, on tropical diseases and the immunology of tropical diseases. Back in the States, I decided to switch fields a little bit and go into molecular endocrinology, learning the molecular basis of obesity, diabetes, and, and uh, in, in essence, what makes fat cells tick, right? So throughout that, I did field work in various places in Central America, Mexico, England, and, and Ghana. I remember uh, one of my mentors told me once, if you work in science, you'll travel more than an ambassador and will handle as much money as a banker. And, and it's really true. It's really true when we think of the amount of money that we handle in, in scientific research from instrumentations to the value of reagents, et cetera. So it's, uh, it feels like I've been around a little bit, right? And every single bit of it has enriched my life uh, greatly. Now as an educator, really it's, uh, I, I taught high school, if you can believe that, I, I taught high school before I graduated from college, uh, still as a college student. Uh, that was my first, um, really my first experience teaching some other people, right? In this case, young people. At the university level, after I graduated from college, I did teach for the biochemistry program at my home university in Guatemala, where I was able to teach biochemistry and other things in the same career. At a college level, as Sheila mentioned, I started my, my higher education teaching career at uh, Illinois Central in Peoria, Illinois, as an adjunct instructor for microbiology and bacteriology for one of the programs. And then I was hired at Triton College to teach microbiology, which I have been doing since 2007. And more recently, about four years ago, I started to teach cell and tissue culture for our uh, biotechnology laboratory assistant pro uh, program. So it, at some point, it feels like I've done uh, a little bit of everything. Now, when I started teaching, I remember that uh, when I came to the States and I started teaching, I remember that I needed to in my application for several places, I needed to put together something called a teaching philosophy, which to me, I, I, I have no clue what a teaching philosophy was. I talked to a person at Illinois State University once, and um, when I mentioned this thing about a teaching philosophy, he said, well, what do you believe in teaching? What, what's your belief about teaching? How do you think teaching should go? And what, what do you identify with? So I explained to him, well, I wish I could be taught the way I, I wish I, I want to teach in the way that I wish I could have been taught when I was a student. And he said, but this is a different century. <laughs> so uh, does that still apply? And it was a very important question for me to, to answer. And is when I really started to read about what teaching philosophies are, what, what exactly do, does that mean? And what would describe me as an educator um, that I can put in a document telling everybody, this is what I believe teaching is for me. 
So in a nutshell, my teaching philosophy really involves two main things. It's, it's really simple. Care on the one hand and reciprocity on the other. And start with reciprocity. Reciprocity means to me that it's a two way, it's a two way um, uh, process here between the student and the instructor. So to me, it's important that my students understand that I can't be the best teacher in the world, but if they don't want to learn, they won't learn. Or vice versa, they may be <clears throat> the most eager students, but um, if I'm not very good at teaching, they, they won't learn much. So somehow this reciprocity also means trust in that I will be at the top of my game in order to help them understand all the information they need to acquire. But I also trust that they will be on top of their game to be receptive to that information. The care part, it's uh, probably the, the umbrella of all of these is best summarized in this quote from Barbara Harrell uh, Tarson, which I always love. Students learn what they care about from people they care about and who they know care about them. I know it looks like a tongue twister here, but look at the word care. It shows a lot there. That alone implies a lot of relevance in the, whatever it is that we teach. When students uh, care about something, they learn it a lot easier. So my job is to find what exactly do they care about and weave it into the information that I am supposed to present to them. Um, they also need to know that as their instructor, and I'm not out there to get them. I, I really, I don't get paid to get uh, uh, out there and get them really. They need to trust that I do care about them um, in a way that I will never, and I can never say, I don't care who you are, I will treat you the same way in a way that says, I oh, know I care who you are because you're all different. And just as a funny example, I know that if you are not from this part of the country, the word firefly doesn't mean anything for you. You call it somewhere else and we're talking about the same insect. So I do care about who the student is. I do care about what, uh, um, background they have. I do care about what cultural background they have, right? I have my own cultural background as well. So I have to care. I cannot really say ever that I am colorblinded, right? Because I don't want to be colorblinded. I really need to be aware of all the colors, uh, metaphorically speaking, that I have in all my students. So <clears throat> this in a nutshell is really what my uh, teaching philosophy is. And since I'm an educator, I truly believe that people, uh, that when we present things, we shouldn't uh, you know, just talk about things, but we should all, always invite the um, engagement and the opinion of the participants. So I will ask you to uh, just follow these simple instructions on your cell phone. Um, go to this <clears throat> webpage, paulev.com slash my name, Gabriel Guzman. And then you will engage in an, uh, an interactive poll and don't worry about it. There's, there's only three questions there, two questions that I will ask now and then one towards the end of the presentation. So I'm gonna give you about 30 seconds to go to your device and go to uh, your uh, browser and put paulev.com slash Gabriel Guzman. And then you will see an image there. I just activated this poll And uh, you can exactly, two people are already doing it. See, uh, I see a whole lot of push, uh, uh, push pins here telling uh, what you believe represents equity in this image. And a lot of us are probably now familiar with uh, uh, similar images like that. So I'm gonna give you some 30 more seconds to accumulate more responses and then have a drink of water in the meantime. I can already see that the majority is choosing the image on the right. When I do this with my students with different questions, I never hide the answers from them because there is also uh, something called, you know, the, um, the influence of the majority. And a lot of students, they start answering their questions, right? And then all of a sudden see that the majority is answering different. They want to answer like that too. It's the effect of the majority, I said. And sometimes the majority may or not be you know, correct. 
Okay, five more seconds. And I think that, uh, yes, the majority now is choosing the image on the right. In a graded class, I would say, well, you get an A or you get a B or something because you answered this correctly or incorrectly. But since I'm trying to ungrade this, I will not tell you. I'm just going to say that um, you actually do have a very good, the majority of you have a very good idea what equity is. So if the image on the right is equity, you can type in the chat box uh, what the image in, on the left represents. And the image on the left represents equality, which are both important concepts, right? Equality means giving everything the same tools, but equity means giving people who need different tools the tools they need to achieve the same goals, which is what the image on the right tries to represent. So the majority actually thinks that equity is what is representing on the right to give uh, students not just the same tools, but actually tools that can help them according to who and what they are. So one more question. Okay, I'm gonna go to the next question here. I'm going to activate this. And then in your device, just choose A, B, C, or D. Uh, according to what your answer is. I design my classroom activities in a way that they incorporate equity. Um, and a quick definition of what would might be is different ways in which students can demonstrate learning. I, I'm also not, not hiding all the answers because I do want you to see if you are able to see how these bars are now moving between the different levels, right? These, um, this is always very interesting to see when I do polling, this real polling um, in the classroom. And as you notice, I don't see names. This is completely anonymous. So students are very eager to participate when their names are not visible, right? So they can be absolutely honest. And um, here, I just need to know uh, you know, who says, yeah, I mean, how many of you say yes, or how many of you said no, or how many are tried, uh, tried to do it, or are not sure how to do that. Those of you who said yes, please, please use the chat uh, space to write down uh, your email so everybody that is interested can contact you and learn more about the activities that you incorporate in your class in order uh, that to, to incorporate equity into your own class. So that's actually very important. It's the only reason that I am asking this. So that those of you who said yes can share with the rest of us some of the activities and give us some tips into how can we uh, do something similar in our own classes. So thank you for participating. There's one more question that is going to happen a little later. Let's go back to talking more, more about teaching philosophies and, and equity, whatever our teaching philosophy is, it really needs to, at some point, incorporate what teaching, what equity is, which is one of the most important things in, in our profession, right? Um, my teaching philosophy has morphed. The, the essential things have never changed, but uh, the way I implement it has changed uh, a great deal. I was not aware of the difference between equity and, and equality, uh, to be honest, or until a few years back. Um, and that led me to join a, a conference in 2020 uh, about assessment. And this is when I started to hear a lot more about equity and practical ways in which equity could be um, implemented in our classes. And that's how it led me to now uh, lose the fear and try to incorporate on grading in my own classes as one way to increase equity in what I do. We're going to get to that in a few moments. The image that you see here is how I really see this. Um, I used to see all my students, you know, like pencils of uh, different shades of gray, right? Uh, but still kind of very, very similar, right? Now I tend to see my students still as pencils, but completely different. Yeah, and I have to cater to all of those different, um, if I want to say that in my class, I do try to increase or incorporate equity in what I do. 
All right. So that's uh, um, enough about me and my teaching philosophy. I think the meat of this presentation is for me to show you my hips, and which is exactly what I'm going to do right now. These are high impact practices that I've used that have somehow increased the engagement and, and success in my students. I have changed the name of the word participation. I don't call it participation anymore. I call it engagement because it's very different. Participation may be somebody who, a student who, you know, talks for the sake of saying something and that in his or her mind may be uh, participation. But by participation, I mean engagement, truly engage in doing in activities or whatever it is that we have in our class. And there are three that I have found that are the most impactful things that have helped me uh, in my job. The first one, it has to do with active learning. And I think most of us are really aware of what active learning is, right? Active learning is really learning by, by doing. And it has a lot of good things. It allows for different ways of expression for students. It empowers them, but it also can lead a little bit to, to panic from us instructors when we realize that in order to allow for that, we also have to relinquish a little bit of the control in our class. And, and that could be a scary thing sometimes. If you have ever tried to do a flip class, then you talk about the, what, uh, you know what I'm talking about when I say that kind of panic, right? Because all of a sudden you stay behind, you stayed aside just to answer questions. Your students now control what's happening in, in the classroom. Um, there are many things that I have tried with active learning and some of the most successful ones is really uh, something that I call uh, enactments, you know, like concept enactments. What you're looking at on your screen right now is uh, a video of my students trying to enact how they understand an enzymatic pathway. Each one of them is an enzyme and there's a ball that is being, you know, passed on from one to another. And that represents the substrate that is being changed by each enzyme till the end of the pathway. We use the same thing. So there's another student timing them to see how many seconds does it take to complete that. And then we inhibit the enzyme, one of the enzymes there. We chose one to inhibit the enzyme competitively or non-competitively and um, see what happens with the time. And then we, we, the students can actually see if the pathway slows down or it shuts down completely, right? It's a very simple thing to do, right? And the students actually came up with this kind of idea of how they wanted to explain to the rest of us what they understood an enzymatic pathway is within the context of enzyme inhibition. That actually, uh, uh, as, as you can imagine, makes a lot of people laugh at what they're looking, which is also good. That alone helps with the blood pressure you know, during class. Other types of uh, things that I do is collaborative uh, projects. This uh, is something that students have to come up uh, with a solution on their own. This is, it could be problem-based problem, problem -based learning or project-based learning. I just give them, this is called the marshmallow challenge and I just give them 20 pieces of spaghetti, fresh spaghetti, uh, one marshmallow, um, a yard of masking tape and a yard of string and a pair of scissors. With only those materials, they have to, in 18, minutes exactly they have to build a structure that will be freestanding and it's going to be the tallest freestanding structure they can come up with with the condition that it has to be done in 18 minutes they cannot use any more than what i'm giving them to do to use and the marshmallow needs to be on top it cannot be used as glue it has to be on top of the structure um there's a lot of lessons to be to be uh learn from the marshmallow challenge and i'll be happy to explain that um, during the q a or if you want i can share with you the entire powerpoint that i have with the marshmallow challenge music included and the entire lesson for it uh, there are other things that are very powerful in terms of active learning and that really empowers students um, classroom debates which is something i use as their final exam and it's as expensive as 15 percent of their grade in this case, students have eight weeks to prepare uh, their debates, but the topic that they are, they are going to debate, uh, they only know the topic. They don't know what side of the debate or what side of the issue they are going to focus on. They will know that a week before um, they present the debate. I do that to minimize their uh, 
confirmation bias, right? So they have to they have to research both sides of the of the issue, and then they focus on just one side once they know what what is it that they have to defend, uh, as it were, during the debate. This gives uh, a lot of power to students, you know, um, because now they feel like they have to fight, quote unquote, to win this debate. There's no winners or losers, actually, right? Is how they use the information, what sources do they use, do they research to present the information, and honestly, how convincing they are with their arguments. And the most important part is that always there will be a group that does not agree with the side they are trying to defend, but that's the side they have to defend. And the most important part is when they share with us if they change their minds or not um, as a result of the research that they've done. And lastly, uh, other things that I love to do is um, activities that are called sketch and build. I will talk about the sketch uh, in a second, but Basically, a sketch is an activity where students have to just do that, sketches. I, I'm not asking for our, um, you know, works of art. It's just plain sketches that need to, be, need to meet two conditions. Um, one condition is that they have to be uh, complete. All the components need to be present and accuracy. They have to be in the right place. In this case, what you see in the picture is a sketch of the cell wall. And it has an activity that is attached to it as well. If you're interested in that, please just uh, let me know. I'll be happy to share it with you. And the building activities, which a lot of students have a lot of fun because they say they haven't done this since kindergarten, is truly use uh, you know, affordable materials as paper to do cutouts of molecules. And then they have to complete an activity about it. In this case, the student is cutting out a model of an enzyme. And once the models are complete, then um, the lesson is about explaining how substrates and inhibitors fit or don't in the enzyme structure in order for a reaction to be catalyzed. This has had a lot more success explaining en how enzymes work than the rhetoric that I used to use. You know, it lowered the energy of activation and my students don't know exactly what that means until we get to do this activity. The second most impactful, impactful thing is the developing of metacognition of students in students using something called adaptive learning technology. The first time we ask students what do they know metacognition is, even if they Google it, they come up with answers like, uh, well, it's, it's you know, um, reflecting about learning, but what exactly is that? It doesn't really translate into something that they can put into practice. A way that I find helps explain this is um, using this image, actually, of a painter. It, there, are, there are two activities that are happening here, whether it is painting or whether it is learning. One is just you know, how the brush moves to produce the paint, how the brush moves on the canvas. But then on the mind of the, of the painter, there's another thing going on, which is called meta painting, right? In this area, or in these thoughts of the painter, the painter is doing a lot of things from reflecting about the painting, from um, putting, in con putting in practice what he knows about contrasts, you know, light versus sh uh, uh, shade, um, discerning when should he apply a particular technique with the brush or when should the painter use a palette knife. They are, they, they are completely different techniques. Uh, the process of painting these, I mean, do I do the background first? How, wh what layer do I apply, exact, uh, et cetera? And then monitoring the progress of that painting. All of that is what we call meta something. So when we talk about metacognition uh, of learning and meta learning, one thing is to access the information, right? But the meta learning is how confident am I, am I of what I'm learning? Can I reproduce that learning? Can I show that I've learned something in a way that is not necessarily a test? Uh, can I make a diagram to explain something? All of that is what, I, what we mean by metacognition. The question that I'm sure you all have is, well, that's all nice, but I have 600 students, so how can I do that with 600 students? Very difficult to do with 600 students, but it's possible. <laughs> and is where the, te the word technology comes into it. Basically, when we talk about 
uh, um, metacognition and what kind of technology are going to use. What we want to do is to have students understand that either we know stuff or we don't. There's no other way. And when we know something, either we are sure or we are not sure. There's no other option. We are not half sure. We are either sure or not. So a metacognitive level is really the combination of how much we know and our awareness. How sure are we of what we know? By producing these four metacognitive levels, for example, when students are correct about something and they are really, they know that they are correct. This is what we want all our students to be, right? That uh, builds confidence in them. But sometimes students are correct, but they don't know it. They, they say, I don't, I'm not sure if this is the correct answer for this question. And they had it correct. They are unaware that they are correct, like this uh, yellow dot here. Or they may simply say, I, I know I really don't know about this answer, but here it is, I'm just gonna guess. Well, they are aware that they don't know things. And that is one of the best metacognitive levels actually, because the only uh, logical outcome is that uh, they will seek knowledge, right? To get out of that level. And then of course, the most dangerous level would be not being aware of what we don't know. Actually, we think of now something when in fact we don't. Right, because then we don't feel the need to go and learn anything. So adaptive learning technology really is um, in essence, a whole bunch of questions, like millions of questions that students have to interact with. But before they can answer something, they have to say, how sure are they? Uh, yes, there is a publisher that started to use this in 2010, right? Uh, and, and I actually jump into that because I wanted to see if it would be of any benefit for my students, right? By generating that kind of data for each student, what we call a metacognitive uh, profile, we could zoom in a, a to students that probably needed a little bit more help, you know, than other students like this one here that six uh, out of uh, 10 questions, it was saying, uh, yes, I know, but what, but, but didn't. No, then there is something that maybe we could help there with more resources, uh, and then there are students that are just navigating this really well. They, they are sure of their answers. But the question for me was always, okay, uh, are, are, are they displaying this metacognitive level because they are better guessers or not? So I needed to study a little bit about that. And I started between 2010 and 2012. Uh, that publisher really um, put out um, a case study where I used this tool to demonstrate that uh, by using the tool my students could increase you know their scores by you know two grades i was still grading by the way at the time i wanted to know how much guessing was going on or how metacognitive levels were changing as students were using this technology and uh, with the help of another uh, faculty here that uh, we really uh, believed in this we started to collect uh, information in all our classes. So altogether, it was more than 500 stu uh, students between 2012 and 15. And what we found is something that is kind of intuitively obvious, right? Um, that students that are really sure of what they know, they're very confident, they usually hover in the A grades. Kind of a duh, we know that. But it was kind of nice to have data to back that up. It's not just now, uh, uh, a guess of my part. I have something that shows me that this is really what it is. Um, we also noticed that if the metacognitive profile, you know, as determined by the tool, um, was the dominant uh, metacognitive level was the unaware and incorrect, then the grade started to really, really be worse, right? And this is important information for students to see before they actually are convinced to use this tool. So we can show them not only that it worked, but it could help them increase their level of confidence as well. Um, they have access to the same reports every time, so they can monitor their learning as well with numbers, with some kind of measurement, not just in a very subjective way. The last um, uh, high impact uh, practice. And, and I should say here that all of these, okay, all of these are work in progress. 
uh, every semester I learn something about it and I change things that I don't think uh, have worked and I implement other things that may work or not. And then I assess and see if they did. But the last one is ungrading, right? Which is uh, as such a very um, controversial topic as well. Sometimes it's a little bit more like a movement, but ungrading, um, means really that my students are gonna get a grade. It's just that they are not gonna be graded in the same way. If we go back to the poll in this last uh, five or six minutes that is left or seven minutes that is left, um, I want you to go back to that poll again and I will activate the third question. What percentage of your course grade is based on exams? You know, as summative assessment, I'm not talking about quizzes, formative assessment, it's summative assessments. You can see the large variety here. The majority, majority uh, is saying between 50 and 70%. So half to two uh, thirds of the, or three quarters of the class is based on exams, right? So I'm gonna show you what my grading system looks like. Um, I try to make it as simple as possible for my students. This shows on my syllabus graphically and also uh, spelled out what's covered where and how much is or used to be. Um, I try to make it simple uh, with more emphasis in active learning because that's what we do more than just exams. Uh, and last off, you know, the doing, doing things. It's easy to understand. They can calculate the grade at any time during the semester. But I still deal with this end of semester begging. And I dare that somebody tells me that you haven't deal with, dealt with this. Can I get another? Can I do extra credit? Can I get an extension? Can I do this? Can I do that? Because how am I doing? At the end of the semester, when there's very little to actually be done, it's sometimes unfair that we get a question, how am I doing? I didn't know I wasn't passing. If everything has been explained to them and everything is uh, accessible to them to see really how are they doing. So um, everybody who tries or, or, or tries to get uh, or implement on grading does it because we recognize what the reality of grading really is. We're not happy with the way grade, grading actually works for our students. The system is very punitive, ranking, and it's a very transactional one. I'll do this if you give me an A. Okay, I didn't do this, then I'll get a B, but can I still get an A even though I didn't do it? So on grading tries to deal with this kind of reality because research does show that there are three predictable effects of grading. Students, they don't have much interest in learning. They have interest in the letter or the score. They, if you have them to, if you ask them to choose, they will prefer easier tasks for the same kind of grade. And doesn't allow for anything but shallower thinking because they are focused on the actual grade rather than how important it is what they're doing to learn. So this fixation also leads to terrible things, right? Like cheating, like, uh, uh, the focus on accumulating points rather than accumulating learning. And their mindset also is not moved from grade seeking, uh, sorry, for knowledge seeking to uh, uh, from grade seeking, right? So there are a lot of really bad things about grading. And if we don't agree with that, then we wanna do something about it. And one of those things is, well, to eliminate grades altogether and replace it with something that is more meaningful, meaningful for students. So why would I do that is because there are, there are a lot of may, may do this, may do that. I started with just that. It may remove the stress of focusing on grades. That's something I really want in my class. It may create a positive atmosphere without fear of uh, you know, threat. Like if you don't complete this then, or you have to do this or else, it may shift the student mindset really from a, a, a fixed mindset to a growth mindset. It may actually eliminate the end of semester begging, you know, and, and hopefully it make my students actually enjoy coming to class because they're not coming because they want to grade, they're coming because they are really interested in what I have for them to do so they can learn something about microbiology. 
So how do we implement these? This is, this is a good start. And I will recommend this book. I have no stake on this book. In 2020, I read this book when I went to that assessment uh, conference. And I've been so eager to, to attend something like this since, but I still was the chair of the department of my department back then. So time wasn't really uh, available for me to do it. Now that I'm not the chair, I decided I can do this. So I, I really spent an entire semester prepping for implementing this a semester, uh, a semester later, which was last spring. I, I will not tell you about all the history of grading. You can read all about it in this book. And the people who uh, participated in this book have practical ways of implementing it. And I just adapted one of them into my own class as the first time that I do it. This, the second thing you need to do is you have to have a strategy to implement. In my case, it's something called contract grading, okay? Uh, I will explain that in a second. And the most important thing, if you want to implement something like this is you have to involve your administration. Basically, you have to ask permission. You have to te teach them, not teach them, but you have to explain to them what, what, what is it that you want to do, how you want to do it. You have to anticipate their questions. Um, my administrators had a whole lot of very good questions for me to answer. For example, if a student decides not to participate in an ungraded class, can that student still have access to the learning objectives? And the answer to that should be always yes. It doesn't matter if a student is in an ungraded class or not, they always have to have access to the learning objectives. Have a plan B if you need to switch things, you know, uh, mid-course. Uh, and be willing to ditch some of your activities if you find that by implementing or grading, you are not going to have the same, they're not going to be as effective as you thought they were. And also be willing to accept when things just don't work out, because they may not work out. Remember, students have been in this educational system that we have right now for years, right? So uh, try to change that in one semester, maybe it's unrealistic. But when you do it, be ready for a lot of surprises that are gonna come from your student, uh, for the, from the feedback from your own students. Okay, so the, the strategy that I use is called contract grading. In essence, contract grading is, okay, uh, let's use that word loosely, okay? It's not a, it's not a legal contract uh, and, and we might get in trouble with that an agreement, if you will. But contract grading is really telling the students what grade you want, you are going to contract for a grade that you will choose. And these are the terms of the contract. If you fulfill all the terms of this contract, you will get the grade that you are contracting for. This is where you specify absolutely everything you want a student that will get an A, what is it that they have to do. The moment they don't do that, they cannot get that. They're breaching their contract and they have to specify what the consequence is. Most logically, the consequence would be you will be downgrade to the next grade, right? And if you keep not meeting those, you will keep you will be downgraded in the end. So on grading is not that we don't give a grade. We have to give a grade at the end of the semester. We are obligated to do so. But how do we get there is different. All the assignments are gonna be graded, quote unquote, in a very different way, no numbers, no letters, right? So the contract has to be really very, very well uh, explained for students. And I give my students a week to think about it. And then they give me a little you know, tab uh, with their signature and somebody who's witnessing them signing that. And then I sign and I keep that copy and they have, uh, they have a copy as well. Because in the end, it's interesting to know, well, you wanted an A, did you get an A and do you think you deserve an A in the end? I'll show you the results in a minute. So how do I really ungrade things, right? I do it by detailed feedback and very specific. Remember that picture of the student doing sketches? Well, this is how the grade really looks like, okay? There are no letters and no numbers. There's just very, uh, abundant feedback uh, on my part. What I do here is that they put all those, uh, remember they were doing these sketches on gigantic post-it. So I put that on the, on the wall, I take a picture of each one of them. And then uh, the, the weekend of that week uh, with my iPad, I sit down and I annotate all their, 
older uh, sketches, right? And I offer them plenty of things that they need to improve because they will have to show me later that they have internalized this feedback and they are able to improve what they did. Then I will say that the uh, assignment is a satisfactory assignment. And then I can put it in on my table saying, yes, satisfactory. So the grade will come after the student completes all the assignments in a satisfactory way, right? And they will know if it's satisfactory or not. So for them, basically, uh, is when I say meet the terms of the contract is they have to complete every single thing that they have committed to do, right? Without failure. So you may think right now, okay, that's quantity. Well, how do I assure quality of their work? That's where you come into place. That's where I come into play, into this picture. My feedback helps them improve. My feedback helps their quality. They are in charge of the quantity. I'm in charge of helping get the quality, right? Right now, if you're thinking, oh my God, forget about it. This is way too much work. You're not, you're not wrong. There's a lot of work, which is why I mean, you may have to ditch some of the activities that you have there and in favor of some other activities that are gonna be way more for fulfilling if you grade them this way. So in the end, there's a little bit of a trade-off. There's a lot more, more work giving feedback, but you don't have to do it in the 20, 50 activities that you used to have, because some of them really are, you're gonna find out that they're not really conducive to anything. Another way in which I, I do this kind of feedback and I help students realize, realize their own metacognitive levels is, uh, some tests, for example, have these uh, faces, and the happy face means, yes, I know and I'm sure, and the sad face means, uh, I don't know, I'm just going to guess. And these uh, middle faces, like, I'm not sure, you know. So when a student has a question that is correctly answered, and they actually circle this, this is their, their uh, confidence level uh, that they are uh, telling me. I have to tell them, see, this is what being correct and aware means. So they can understand the reports that they're going to see as they are using the adaptive learning technology that I have available for them. Uh, sometimes I can see that students uh, incorrectly answer something, but they know that. They know they didn't know the, the information, but they just want to answer anyway. And then I explain what being incorrect and aware really means, right? So this is another way in which I offer feedback. Of course, there is uh, other examples that I have that are have more detail that has to do with essays or um, you know, electronic board submissions, uh, lab reports, etc. But this, I think this gives you an idea of what ungrading really means, how to give information to the student that is really useful for them to improve instead of a number or a letter. Uh, to assess this whole thing, I did build a robust uh, survey where I needed to know exactly, well, I thought I was going to reduce the stress level. Did that really happen? So these are 36 questions that I put there that tried to measure everything from their stress level, uh, what I think it was, um, to the atmosphere in the classroom, to their type of uh, motivation, right? And just at a glance, um, these are just some preliminary results here. Majority agreed that um, knowing the grade they will get from the beginning helped them stay motivated throughout the, the course, which is a good thing. Um, also, the majority agreed that not having to worry about a grade in, in the specific in the individual assignments helped them complete their work uh, without stress, which is, is also a good thing. Um, a little over half of them still still say that they submitted assignments at the very last minute, you know, so they didn't give themselves enough time to complete. They completed on time, but they left it for the very last minute. So I need to work uh, a little bit on that to, to try to convince students that there is a benefit on not doing it at the very last minute in terms of learning. Um, uh, the majority also agreed that I tried to understand how they see things before I told them how to do it. And that's also very important. Usually we tell students, this is how I want you to do this, uh, this uh, you know, essay. Uh, sometimes I wanted to ask, okay, do you have another way in which you think you could do this? And if we have an agreement, then they, they can do it. Um, so it's important to always get their feedback. Now, 
remember, I had 23 students and 21 say they wanted an A, 22 uh, students say they wanted a B. Of all of those 21, 41% at the end in a self-reflective uh, uh, exercise said that, uh, yes, I wanted an A and I'm happy with my A. Interestingly enough, not everyone thought about that. 27% of those who wanted an A in the end said, no, I probably deserved a B, but they completed absolutely everything for an A. So why are they thinking they, des they, they deserve anything less? And 32% of those who said, yes, I wanted an A from the beginning said, no, I deserved a C in the end when they completed everything. So that is something um, that tells me students are still don't feel worthy of these things. They don't feel worthy of the work or deserving of the grade that they get in the end based on the work that they have done, which is an interesting thing that I will have to think a little bit more about it. Um, I want to just he live here before I finish some of the comments that students offer um, in terms of the experience that they had through this ungraded experience. Um, things like I felt more focused uh, my, uh, to I, I, I feel more I felt more free to focus my learning on aspects of the content that either uh, that I, were either fun or interesting or felt it would be likely to be applicable to my future life. I, I just copy pasted this from them. So, uh, you know, excuse the grammar because I didn't change anything there. All in all, what I learned from this experience is that this experiment of ungrading my class seemed to have removed the stress of thinking about grades in favor of students more focused on the activities and the learning they could get from those activities. At least half of my students um, still displayed a type of extrinsic uh, motivation as opposed to intrinsic. I mean, a lot of them do ex uh, display uh, what is called identify regulation when students find value in an activity, but they don't say, oh, I, I did it because I just loved it. You know, this is the best. No, they said I did it because I thought it was good for me, you know. And then the other, uh, the rest of the students are still doing things because they have to. Even though they said that the stress was minimal, right? They still felt that they needed to do the activities because they have signed a contract, because they had to. And that's what is called external regulation. So that is something that I have to kind of work uh, a little bit and probably explain students about what motivation really is so they can learn to recognize in which uh, type of motivation they are most of the time, right? And the last thing is that really what this taught me is that I cannot change in one semester all the years that my students have been in this in this system where it's very transactional. You do this, I give you a grade. You don't do it, then you give I give you nothing. We talk about I'll give you a grade. We don't say you do this, you will learn why microbes are everywhere. If you do this, you will learn why COVID is called. Uh, I mean, SARS-CoV-2 is called a novel or an emergent disease, things like that. So I cannot really expect that in one semester alone, right, I will be able to change all the years. So I had to be a little bit more, uh, you know, patient with myself. I know some of the things that I need to change this semester coming, uh, that is starting in, in a week. Um, for those students that will choose to be in an ungraded format in my grade, in my classroom. So um, I, I know I could, I could speak for days <laughs> about these, but I know time is limited and I need to respect their time as well. So with this, I just, I just have to say thank you and I'll be happy to answer any questions you might have. All right. Thank you, Gabe. Uh, we have a few minutes before we wrap up the webinar. There have been some questions from the audience on the chat. And I think you covered a few of them already in your presentation. And let's go to two of them. So we want to keep time for two. So the first one is a question on learning environment. Have you noticed any differences in the impact of ungrading in different groups of students, especially in a community college? We have a wide variety of students coming in with different levels of preparedness. Could you take a minute to talk on that? And then there is another question right after that. Yes, um, I cannot answer the question because remember this, I did it in the spring of 20, 
uh, 21, and it was only with one class. That was really a look-see type of experiment. And um, although, I mean, most of the students wanted to, to be part of the experiment, I told them this is an experiment. So most of them wanted to participate in the, in the experiment. I think what, what, what got them interested is to know that they could choose their grade from the beginning, right? Um, this semester coming in, I can do that comparison because one of my classes will not be ungraded and the other will be. Uh, I teach three classes and the third class, they'll have a choice. So I need to explore all those three. Logistically, I know it's a nightmare, but I'm kind of excited about it. I can only say that from the one class that, that, that had my class ungraded in the spring, only one student really said I did it because, because you know, I, I was worried if I didn't do it, but I don't think this is for me. I would still like to do my stuff. I still like to see that I'm getting something back from my effort. So she didn't really believe that the grade she had was reflective of the effort she did. And she did actually everything as she was supposed to. You know, she was one of my best students, I have to say. Um, she was one of my older students as well. So they, that may also play uh in into these dynamics all right of course there has to be an assessment question all the time oh yes right so ungrading is a very innovative teaching practice right now do you have any go-to assessments in some ways but also how do you assess what students have learned in the class i mean you did talk about it with your feedback but if you want to take a minute and then there is one more on professional development Yes, and remember that every ass every assignment actually is assessed. Uh, and and actually, thank you for using that word because so we can stop saying every assignment is graded, right? It's assessed. As I show you just in a few pictures, the first time these these uh, students do these sketches, not not a single sketch was correct. They all have something that needed to improve. When you give them the feedback and explain exactly what things are not correct, and then you give them the opportunity to do it again, right? Then you can see if students have internalized that, um, that feedback. Then you can actually see if they learn that the peptidoglycan layer is not really before the cell membrane in a, in a bacterial cell, right? Which is fundamental in microbiology. Every one of us has to design a way that we will feel satisfied that a student is demonstrating their learning. If a student can, can tell me the rhetoric of how to grow microbes, but until I see isolated colonies on a Petri dish, you still cannot do it. Just like watching my wife do gardening over the summer doesn't make me a gardener because everything I plant, it can unfortunately die. So I'm not there yet. I know in theory, in my head, what I need to do, but unfortunately in my hands, it doesn't work. Okay, there's one on professional development and then we'll get to one more that's coming up. Yes. So you mentioned a little bit about setbacks and moments of despair. We have a lot of faculty who teach many of the life science courses. What was your most notable setback when it comes to teaching innovative practices in, in the classroom? And what's one tip you can give to overcome those setbacks so that you can actually create some sustainable change? And how did it keep you going? Um, I can think of one time, I'm not sure if this is going to be a setback, but I did have an activity for students and uh, assessing the activity in the end. Without exception, they all hated it. <laughs> I thought it was the, a great thing to do. And my students actually did tell me, no, this is really a very bad one. Um, usually, I, I used to have a little stress ball and say, okay, here's this concept. Whoever gets this ball, you know, is going to have to teach us about this concept, not just throw the ball. And um, I, actually, I thought that would be engaging and everything. It was the most hated thing that, I, that my students said they have ever seen. It was like, you're forcing me to do this. Um, as it, it, th th that's no difference between me saying, you know, uh, Johnny, can you answer this question? Just put you on the spot there. I just didn't, I just left it to chance, you know, and they hated it there. So I, I figured out a way of not doing it that way, right? 
uh, technology is great because I have a random generator of numbers once I put my roster. So I ask a student uh, to choose somebody. So it's not on me, it's on you. Um, and we do it a little bit of a fun in a, in a funny way. So there are ways around that. I, I have had more setbacks, I have to say, uh, when I was a student myself that uh, as an educator. Okay. Um, I am fortunate to say that in terms of, uh, I mean, institutionally, the things that I want to, to implement, I have never, I have never been received with a, no, you cannot do that. And probably because I do a lot of lead work and explaining what the benefits could be, as well as, you know, the problems that I may encounter. That's why I said you always have to, you always have to involve the administration, explain exactly what is it that, the crazy thing that you want to do. <clears throat> so I think it's the end of the hour. We have a tight limit on this webinar. And thank you so much, Gabe. There are a few more questions fielding through, but uh, we can answer them later. Thank you, Gabe, for the wonderful presentation. And thank you to everyone who actually attended and participated in this webinar. Please make sure that you go to NABT's events and webinars page and take a look at the recorded presentation as well as the resources that go with it. I also wanted to take this time to make one quick announcement and promote the NABT Professional Development Conference that's actually coming up in Indy for many of us in the Midwest. It's just super close. It's November 10th to the 13th, 2022. Registration is open and I'm just going to post the link on the chat for everyone. And with that, thank you very, very much. I just added my email there in the chat if somebody would like to you know contact me or if you can share my contact information please i'll be happy to answer any any questions uh, of the questions that we missed or if there's anything that i might have missed here all right thank you thank you very much thank you have a wonderful weekend bye um, everybody bye bye